I'm Mike, and this is Through the Looking Glass, a podcast where we dissect the emotional happenings of history and their portrayals on the big screen. I apologize for our absence uh, these past several months, but due to the pandemic, I'm sure you can understand that life just kind of got in the way. But we're back now, and without further ado, let's just jump right into the episode. I'd like to preface the content of this episode by explaining that I am not an expert in this field. I have a bachelor's degree in history, I'm in graduate school currently working to become a teacher, and I am an historical interpreter at a museum. I'm using the historical method that I was taught in school when I prepare the content of each episode, and I would describe the content of each episode to be introductory and for background information, but it should not be cited as an expert source. Japanese culture and history has long been a huge interest within the West, especially in the United States, but why is that? Some would say it's the fusion of Japanese popular culture and American society through anime and manga. Others would say it's that Americans live in a multicultural society. Americans eat sushi after all, right? They watch Japanese animation, study the language. Well, not everybody does, but a lot of people do. So in this episode, I want to talk about the relationship between Japan and the West through Japan's depiction and entertainment. After all, we're a podcast about history and movies, right? So let's stick with that theme. We'll talk about the historical context, some books, other forms of entertainment, and you guessed it, some movies. In a fictionalized history of Japan, many would assume that Matthew Perry and the opening of the country to outside trade and relations were Japan's first glimpse into the outside world for the first time. But Japan has always had a relationship with China, and even went as far as to adopt or borrow many Chinese aspects to their culture, language, religion, and even their political system. And this cultural borrowing would actually help them a lot when they dealt with the West in the late 1800s. Japan was aware of the West through trade and interaction with China, but direct contact came in the 16th century in the form of Jesuit missionaries and traders from Portugal. A quick Google search can tell us that Oda Nobunaga used firearms from the West to conquer other daimyos, daimyos being a lord who acted as a vassal to the shogun, in an effort to consolidate power. His successor, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, would unify the nation in 1590, but would fail to ensure that his heir would inherit the power he wielded. Tokugawa Ieyasu would defeat rival clans at the Battle of Sekigahara in 1600, and by 1603, the emperor would appoint him as shogun, in which he established the Tokugawa shogunate at Edo, present-day Tokyo. Under Tokugawa Iemitsu, the policy of Sakoku, which roughly translates to closed country, was enacted through policy ranging from 1633 to 1639, and lasted until 1853 when Matthew Perry arrived. But before we get to Matthew Perry, I want to talk a little bit about the period of Sakoku. So why did Japan decide to severely limit its relations with the rest of the world, and more specifically with the West? Well, the first answer is usually that the shogunate wanted to reduce Western influence on Japan, especially in regards to religion. There was an increase of converted Catholics in Kyushu, and the shogunate perceived them as a threat to their own stability. There were also fears of colonization in Japan by Western powers, and another answer is based more on the politics of the Bakufu. The Bakufu is the military government in which the shogun headed. Now, at the time, certain daimyos were using trading posts and linkages in East Asia to grow their wealth and their military strength. So, with the shogun limiting the daimyo's trade through the west, they made sure that the pakufu could not be challenged. But the shogunate did conduct trade with the west through the Dutch East India Company. They were allowed to operate in Nagasaki. The Dutch lived and operated on an artificial island in the Bay of Nagasaki called Dejima. Through this, the Japanese were able to learn about occurrences in the rest of the world and study western sciences. And this was called Rangaku. So, jumping back ahead to 1853, after long periods of isolationism, Japan and China were both pressured to open to trade and relations. China was similar to Japan in that it favored isolationism, but it maintained trade with Western countries. And in the 1830s, Britain began to put more pressure on China to expand trade. Tensions between the two countries began to develop, and it boiled over in 1839 with the beginning of the First Opium War. The results of these opium wars in China were unequal treaties and the beginning of what is known as the Century of Humiliation in China. So Japan looked at what was occurring in China, and with Western powers eclipsing the Japanese both technologically and militarily, they feared a similar outcome. So when Matthew Perry returned in 1854, the Japanese were willing to negotiate, and the Treaty of Kanagawa was signed in March of that year. 
but a commercial treaty was not established until 1858. The opening of Japan helped lead to the fall of the Tokugawa shogunate and the rise of the Meiji government with the restoration of the emperor in 1868. As we mentioned long ago in episode 2, many samurai were frustrated with the Tokugawa shogunate's handling of the growing western influence in their country, and it ended up leading to a decline in their economy, similar to China and other colonized Asian countries. The new Meiji government realized that they couldn't shut out the West completely, but that they would use their aid in order to modernize their country. And that's where that cultural borrowing comes back into play. And the study of the West was not anything new in Japan. We talked a little bit uh, earlier about Rengaku, well, mentioned it. Uh, the shogun allowed and encouraged the study of the West in Japan. And what's interesting is that Rengaku translates to Dutch learning. So we can guess that most of this was done with their dealings with the Dutch in Dejima. Numerous missions were enacted by the Meiji government in order to study the West. And in 1871, the most known, the Iwakura mission, saw over 100 Japanese officials, scholars, and students sent West to attain knowledge in order to create their own plans for a modern country. We briefly covered this mission in the last episode, so for a refresher, the goals of the mission were to gain recognition diplomatically with the West, and to renegotiate unfair treaties initially forced on Japan when they first opened. The adopted slogan of the Meiji government was Fukoku Kyohei, to enrich in the country and strengthen the military. So as we said before, Japan already had experience with borrowing and adopted aspects of other cultures to their own, and this would help them with modernization and in dealing with the West. They created a constitution and a legislative body in the imperial diet. They abolished feudalism and established banks, trains, and other Western systems. We know that not everyone was happy with the changes, and it wasn't necessarily an issue with modernization, but an issue with the loss of privilege that many samurai once enjoyed. And by 1912, Japan emerged not only as the most developed country in Asia, but as an industrialized empire that had established itself as a world power similar to the West, but not quite recognized as one. So that's just a very brief cover of how Japan and the West began to develop relations at the end of the 19th century. But uh, I just wanted to quickly talk about Japanese immigrants to the United States. Yeah, so Sakoku worked both ways. If foreigners weren't allowed in, then native Japanese weren't allowed out. And this changed in 1885. The Meiji government finally allowed immigration, and the first Japanese immigrants to the United States landed in Hawaii. The 1910s saw discriminatory laws that prevented Japanese immigrants from attaining citizenship, and in 1924, an Immigration Act prohibited the entrance of any Japanese immigrant until 1952. Japanese Americans' history with immigration to the United States is similar to other minority groups in that it is a history filled with racism. And for Japanese Americans, it reached new extremes during the Second World War, with forced relocation and incarceration into internment camps. Yeah, so I'm going to wrap up things uh, there with the historical context. I just want to, like I said, give you a brief overview of the history of Japan's relations with the West, how it started to develop, and give you a short look into Japanese Americans' experiences during that time frame. And now, we're going to take a look at how Hollywood has represented Japanese people, their culture, and their history. So I started the last episode about The Last Samurai off by saying that the movie fetishized Japanese culture and is nostalgic for a past that didn't occur. I think this can also extend to many Americans or Westerners' view of Japan and its history, and they actually do the exact same thing with their own history. History is often used in movies as a tool for nostalgia to create feelings of patriotism in audiences. It can also swing in the other way, and we can see examples of that like uh, The Deer Hunter or Born on the Fourth of July. But these other films, they can be full-blown propaganda like Know Your Enemy series from World War II, or they could be massive studio-produced pictures like John Wayne's The Green Berets, and that released uh, towards the beginning of increased U.S. involvement in Vietnam. I, uh, I definitely recommend listening to Karina Longworth's podcast, You Must Remember This, uh, not only for Hollywood history, but to learn more about Wayne's avoidance of serving in World War II and his involvement with the Hollywood blacklist during the Red Scare. Yeah, that, uh, that podcast does a really good job of just talking about lesser-known aspects of history in Hollywood, ranging from actresses to crew members, directors, writers, things like that. And I really think a lot of those stories can illustrate that movies are used as weapons by their countries, and they're not just an art form, as much as many of us want it just to remain that way. And I actually remember a Roger Ebert quote that I heard years back that always stuck with me. 
He said, We are all born with a certain package. We are who we are, where we were born, who we were born as, how we were raised. We're kind of stuck inside that person, and the purpose of civilization and growth is to be able to reach out and empathize a little bit with other people. Find out what makes them tick, what they care about. For me, the movies are like a machine that generates empathy. If it's a great movie, it lets you understand a little bit more about what it's like to be a different gender, a different race, a different age, a different economic class, a different nationality, a different profession, different hopes, aspirations, dreams, and fears. It helps us to identify with the people who are sharing this journey with us. I think it's an amazing quote, and I think it's an accurate summation of many cinephile love for movies. But movies don't always do that. And since we're looking at Japan, I immediately think of Mickey Rooney playing the character of Mr. Yunioshi from Breakfast at Tiffany's. For those not familiar, the character is a Japanese photographer played by a white man, and he's a character come to life. If you've ever seen World War II propaganda posters, you might have seen the Japanese portrayed as animalistic, with exaggerated features like extreme buck teeth, large ears, or extremely narrow eyes. Mr. Yunioshi's appearance strongly resembles some of these characteristics, and it's not the first or last time Hollywood has used ethnic stereotypes in this manner. In Hollywood, Japanese people have usually been portrayed as the sidekick, or even as the mysterious sage-like character offering wisdom, although that typically went to the depictions of the Chinese. But early 20th century films usually saw Japanese portrayed as eccentric, loud, easy to anger, with Japanese men cast as villains and Japanese women cast as quiet and submissive. Many of these stereotypes continue to be portrayed in Hollywood to this day, and it's important to note that these stereotypes were created through a Western view of Japan. But in the late 1970s, American interest in Japanese history and culture began to reemerge, especially since Japan's economy was booming and many Americans feared an economic evasion of America by Japan. Some of those feelings you can actually see in movies like uh, Alien or Blade Runner, where the futuristic settings have Japanese influences on their world. This is easily spotted in the streets of Los Angeles in Blade Runner, and in Alien, the company that employs Ripley is a British-Japanese conglomerate called Wayland yutani But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Before the tech-infused vision of a hybrid Japanese future emerged in the 1980s, a book released in 1975 that would largely influence the United States' image of Japan, its history, and its culture. That book is Shogun, written by James Clavell. James Clavell was an Australian novelist who became a naturalized American later in life and served in the British military during World War II. He became a POW to Japan in 1942, and he would remain one until the end of the war. And Shogun became a bestseller, and the book centers around John Blackthorne, an English sailor who finds himself embroiled in the politics of feudal Japan as the fictional Toronaga rises to power as Shogun. The book is loosely adapted from real-life William Adams, who was the first Englishman in Japan, and Tokugawa Ieyasu's rise to power in the months leading up to the Battle of Sekigahara. In the beginning of the book, Clavel states that he's trying not to recreate history, and instead create a fictionalized story set in feudal Japan. And that is definitely what the book is. Fiction. Uh, Many people still love this book to this day, but I am not in that camp. I'm not going to go into detail about what I don't like about the book, because it's mostly up to personal preference, but there's a series of essays that were published in 1980 called Learning from Shogun. Uh, They go into more detail about the book, and the essays are mostly positive, but there are some criticisms laid out, and I think the essays do a great job of that. So we will make sure to post a link to the essays on our Twitter page. Um, so just be on the lookout for that. Twitter handle is through the Lou 13 uh, But regardless, the, the book was a huge hit, and it was actually adapted into a miniseries in 1980, and the response from Western audiences was massive. Many even credit the miniseries for the growth of Japanese food restaurants in the U.S., but this point was from the documentary about the making of the miniseries, so we can take that with a grain of salt. A large percentage of students and classes related to Japan in the U.S. have all claimed to have read Shogun. And while the West had a great reaction to Shogun, the Japanese were not as impressed. To them, it seemed that Clavel distorted their history whenever he wanted to fit his story. And one of the biggest criticisms is that the main romantic plotline between Blackthorn and the wife of a samurai, Mariko. Uh, The Japanese did not believe that love story to be possible within the time frame, and it was 
to them a Western love story set in Japan, and it just it rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. So the book was not successful, and the miniseries was received negatively in Japan. But if someone was looking for something more authentic to Japan, but still just as entertaining as Shogun, then they might look to the novel Musashi, written by Eiji Yoshikawa and released in 1935. Not only does the book deal with the same time frame as Shogun, but its characters are broader in their walks of life. They're not just nobility. And considering the time that the book released, it gives an interesting insight to how the Japanese viewed themselves and viewed what they would consider proper warriors right before the start of World War II. So we have two books about feudal Japan that were both extremely successful where they were created. One in the West and one in Japan. And the Japanese one is the most authentic. But is that really surprising? I mean, if we look at Hollywood's track record with its portrayal of Asia, Shogun never stood a chance. Hollywood, like many other entertainment industries, blend fictionalized aspects of Japan for their aesthetic to create a romantic picture that looks pretty and otherworldly to Westerners, but disingenuous to the Japanese. We've talked about some negatives, so I just want to bring up some positive examples, though. Uh, for instance, the 2008 DreamWorks animated film Kung Fu Panda was not only a commercial and critical success in the West, but also in China. So much so that the Chinese film industry lamented that the film had many Chinese elements and the main character being a panda, a Chinese national treasure, and made them question if the Chinese film industry could ever make such a film themselves. There are some that uh, have pointed out that the film does use Chinese culture and aesthetics to tell a Western story with Western values, and people don't say that that's necessarily negative or positive, but that to call the film authentically Chinese would be incorrect beyond certain aspects of the film. I will say, however, that Kung Fu Panda is an amazing film, and if you haven't seen it, you should go ahead and watch it. Do yourself a favor. Another interesting example is John Carpenter's 1986 film Big Trouble in Little China, starring Kurt Russell, James Hong, Kim Cattrall, and Dennis Dunn. Kurt Russell plays Jack Burton, a trucker who helps his friend Wang Chi rescue Wang's fiancé from thugs and a sorcerer in San Francisco's Chinatown. The film blends real history of Chinatown with Chinese mysticism, and it drew in Dennis Dunn to play Wang Chi because, in his words, I'm seeing Chinese actors getting to do stuff that American movies don't usually let them do. I've never seen this type of role for an Asian in an American film. Kurt Russell was also interested in the role of Jack Burton because he was not the typical lead hero that always saves the day. For most of the movie, he's out of the loop, rash, and always needing to be saved by the more capable Wang Chi. Carpenter himself said that while Burton thinks of himself as the lead, he's really more of the sidekick to Wang, a flip on the typical format of a white lead and minority sidekick. And on another note, this film is also amazing. James Hong is in both this film and Kung Fu Panda, and I know what you're thinking, and no, it's not a coincidence. The American TV series, Avatar The Last Airbender, is another great example. Uh, the series' world is inspired by a non-Eurocentric model that blends cultural aspects from all over the world, and the result is an amazing animated TV series that, while targeted for children, is still very much enjoyed by many adults all around the world for its cultural awareness, mature themes, engaging story, and fantastic character development. In the words of Uncle Iroh, it is important to take wisdom from different places. If you take it from only one place, it becomes stale and rigid. But what these three examples all have in common is that they're not trying to attempt to tell history or a fictionalized version of it. They're showing respect to the culture they're portraying and trying to tell their own stories. I have another somewhat positive example um, that broaches the historical aspect of storytelling, but it's not as great as these other examples. The 2006 Letters from Iwo Jima uh, was a large step forward as a Japanese-language American-produced film directed by Clint Eastwood, but it doesn't quite reach the mark. The film does stray from stereotyping its characters and attempts to portray the Battle of Iwo Jima in World War II from the perspective of the Japanese. Ken Watanabe, who starred as Katsumoto in The Last Samurai, starred in Letters as General Tadamichi Kurabashi, and I may have completely butchered that last name. I apologize if I did. And the film was a success with Japanese audiences and critics, but some did note that the film still retained that feel of a traditional Hollywood war movie. And one issue that I have, and I'm sure many others do have as well, is that uh, General Kurabayashi spends time in the U.S. in the film, and there's a scene where he tells Americans at a dinner that the United States is the last country in the world that Japan should fight, even though both countries, in actuality, had been preparing war plans against one another in the event of war since the late 1800s. 
I'm not really a fan of this line or its scene because there's a lot of ridiculous hindsight foreshadowing and that it kind of frames, you know, the Japanese generals can be caring and level-headed, but only after spending time with Americans in the United States. It's ridiculous and I, I really don't like it. <laughs> But I could spend a lot of time on this movie, and I probably will in the future, so I think we're just going to stop that right there. The entertainment industry is one of the largest industries in the world. It makes a lot of money, and I used to ask myself what responsibility did it have when it portrayed history on the big screen, or the small screen, or even in a book. I never could answer that question for myself, but I realize now that they do have a responsibility. If they are the largest, or one of the largest industries in the world, then... People are constantly exposed to these representations and interpretations. But that doesn't mean actual representation is taking place, and that doesn't mean these interpretations are correct. Historically, they haven't. We've seen that. And that's where the responsibility comes into play. We need to be considerate, we need to be thoughtful when we are representing other people's histories and cultures, and you should probably include them in the conversation, or at least have them handle it, right? Now, movies used to be the largest entertainment industry in the world, but that title now belongs to the gaming industry. And the gaming industry is just as toxic and problematic as Hollywood when it comes to cultural awareness. But like Hollywood, that doesn't mean every game has to be a product of that. Which brings me to talking about Sucker Punch's studio's most recent game, Ghost of Tsushima, which inspired me to make this episode. Ghost of Tsushima is a third-person action-adventure game that takes place on the island of Tsushima during the first Mongol invasion of Japan. The game was announced in October 2017 and was met with positive reception and excitement from both critics and fans alike. At the time, Sucker Punch Studios was most known for their video game series Infamous, which centers around super-powered characters and the decisions they make and how it affects the story and world. Ghost of Tsushima was a different step for the Washington-based team, and the game released July 17th, 2020, to significant praise. So before I talk more about the game, I just want to say that, yeah, I have played the game in its entirety, I beat the story twice, and I personally, I really love this game. I had a lot of fun with it. But I'm not here to review it. I'm just going to talk about how it was received by Japanese audiences, by American audiences, and how it portrays Japanese culture and history. So I will say it right now, spoilers ahead for Ghost of Tsushima for any people listening that might be interested in playing the game. The game is not authentic to the Mongol invasion, and it's not authentic to the time period it's trying to portray. The character would be a samurai under the Kamakura shogunate, and while he uses a katana in the game, this did not exist at the time, and the character would have more likely used a nagamaki, which resembles a katana, but has a longer handle. Some of the fighting stances and styles are accurate, but of course, liberties were taken, and uh, real-life experts said that their issues were mostly nitpicking. So overall, the samurai aesthetic in the game is more akin to an Edo-era uh, samurai in the 1600s than it would be to a Kamakura samurai in the 1200s. And while Ghost of Tsushima is very much inspired by Akira Kurosawa visually, the game even has its own game mode called Akira Kurosawa mode, where the game is black and white, and the audio is changed to resemble something more along the lines of his films, its story feels more akin to Masaki Kobayashi. Masaki Kobayashi was a Japanese filmmaker known for his epic film trilogy, The Human Condition, the samurai film Harikuri, and the horror film Kwaidan. He's one of my favorite filmmakers of all time, and some may remember that I mentioned Harikuri in the last samurai episode as being one of my favorite films of all time. Kobayashi is considered to be one of the cinematic masters of the Japanese post-war era in film, and what I find most compelling about his films is that they feature anti-war themes with protagonists that are idealistic and independent, who question the systems they live under, come to their own understandings of the world, and they usually end up being killed or defeated by said system. So why does Ghost of Tsushima remind me of a Kobayashi film? Well, Tsushima samurai were known to be dishonorable by exploiting the island's inhabitants, just like many other samurai did on the mainland. After all, they are only human. And in the game, when the Mongols arrive, they recruit those that the samurai took advantage of to show that the samurai code of honor never really existed under these hypocrites. And to see Jin, the main character, Jin's evolution from holding fast to the teachings of his uncle, to fighting honorably um, and abiding by their code of honor, and to someone that uses any technique possible to save his people, to me it's pretty extraordinary, and it re that's what reminds me of the game resembling more of a Kobayashi film.
Jin becomes disillusioned with the system that propagates honor through obedience and servitude to the samurai at the expense of many lives. He instead becomes a folk symbol to the people, and he encourages any and all to fight any way they can in order to repel the invaders and save the islanders, even if he is considered dishonorable. And the game doesn't paint Jin's actions as fully good either, because the Mongols even use some of his poisoning tactics against the people of Tsushima, having Jin question his own actions. But the climax of the game is a Mongol defeat at the hands of Jin and his allies, uh, but the consequences are being branded as a traitor by the Shogun, and sentenced to death by dueling his uncle, who has been a father figure for most of his life. The duel is tense, the music is amazing, and it was the emotional climax of the game. But the game gives you a choice at the conclusion of this battle. You can honor your uncle's last wish to give him a warrior's death, or you can spare him and walk away. I thought that was a great move by Sucker Punch, in that the game isn't being declarative on who is right and what honor actually is, but it lets the player come to their own decision on this, and makes, lets them make their own choice. And while the story isn't perfect, and there are some rough patches in the script in terms of character development and other story beats, it's still a great game. The aesthetic is beautiful, the game does its best to stay respectful of Japanese culture, even if it blends its history for the story. But doesn't Shogun do the same? So, what's the difference here? Well, besides Japanese audiences loving Ghost of Tsushima, with even Japanese game developers wishing they made the game, and while the story has Western elements, it holds strong to Japanese themes and exploring those themes through a Western lens, rather than exploring Western themes through a Japanese aesthetic. And like I said, Ghost of Tsushima is not perfect. It may not even be fully accurate, but it feels a lot more authentic than other attempts by the West to display Japanese history and culture and it probably will ignite many individuals' interest in Japanese culture and history, just like Shogun did. And in a time where cultural appropriation is rightly being called out, Ghost to Tsushima is a refreshing reminder that curiosity into other cultures doesn't always end up offensive or disrespectful. Let's hope others can follow this example. Alright guys, that's pretty much it. That concludes the episode. I hope you all enjoyed it. It's a topic I'm very much interested in. Uh, and again, I know it was very brief on certain points, and that was really the purpose of this episode, is just to broach the conversation through introductory research. I'm not an expert source, and if you have any comments or questions, please, please, please feel free to let us know on our Twitter. Our handle is through the Lou 13 Lou as an L-O-O, and uh, like I said, feel free to reach out, ask us any questions, and keep a lookout for our next episode. That's where we release all of our information, and thanks for listening. I will see you all next episode.